this is a big one. This is the seventh and second to last episode of this short and speedy season. Where to begin? First up, this is an episode that has an atypical narrative structure. The Venture Brothers usually has an episode that breaks conventional narrative structure once per season, such as Return to the House of Mummy and Blood of the Father, Heart of Steel. These are usually pretty cool episodes. OS I Love You is one of my favorite episodes. So what unique narrative device do they use in this episode? The episode opens with Wide Whale pressuring Dr. and Mrs. the Monarch to shoot Dr. Venture with a sniper rifle, which she does. Then, when Dr. Venture is laying on the ground, 21's voiceover begins. Segments of the episode are narrated by various characters. 21 opens his first segment with a flashback. Here we come to one of the Venture Brothers' greatest strengths, self-reference. He tells the story of how he was abducted by the Monarch's henchmen when he was a teenager, Back in the Season 1 episode, Home Insecurity, before 21 was an established character, there is a scene where the Monarch's henchmen and Baron Von Underbite's henchmen are exchanging stories about how they became henchmen. Towards the end of the scene, we hear a henchman with 21's voice say that he was kidnapped by the Monarch's henchmen when he was 15. Most shows would treat that as a throwaway line, but the Venture Brothers took that innocuous line of dialogue and brings it back for a fully animated character backstory. This flashback also has the old Monarch henchmen uniforms, one of which 21 lent Hank in the Season 2 finale, Showdown at Cremation Creek, and the Monarch is wearing his costume from the pilot. It's impressive to see this much attention to detail. It's a shame to see character inconsistencies in the same episode. Hold on, we'll get to that. The flashback transitions to the present, where the Monarch is preparing to face his new arch, a hemorrhoid specialist named Dr. Heine. Dr. Mrs. the Monarch encourages her husband to go through with the arch to raise his level in the guild and warns him to watch out for the blue morpho. The next segment is hers. She explains that the guild was starting to get back on its feet when the blue morpho showed up. The Council of Thirteen assembled a team to handle the blue morpho problem, consisting of Dr. Mrs. the Monarch, Phantom Limb, Red Mantle, Dragoon, Dr. Z, Watch, and Ward. We transition to them in a meeting room. The Blue Morpho was Jonas Venture Sr.'s attack dog and did the jobs that were too dirty for the super scientist with great publicity. Dr. Z tells the story of how he made love to tennis star Billie Jean King in 1973, only for her to reveal herself as the Blue Morpho in disguise. Dr. Z is haunted by how he pulled that one off. The show does have the precedent for operatives undergoing sex changes for the sake of a mission. The Blue Morpho was a vigilante that the guild targeted with a bounty. In 1976, someone claimed that bounty. Unfortunately, the late Sovereign destroyed the information. My guess is that it was Kano, and here's why. He said that he took a vow of silence for taking the life of a great man. We don't know for sure if that was Jonas Venture Sr. It was only implied. However, in the next episode, Rusty calls Kano his dad's mute bodyguard, so Kano was already silent when he was part of Team Venture. So the great man he was referring to probably wasn't Jonas Venture Sr., but it could have been the Blue Morpho. Curiously, Dr. Mrs. the Monarch hasn't mentioned Rusty at all in this scene, Considering how uncharacteristically aggressive she was about him being the Blue Morpho last episode, you think she would have brought it up. However, it is Dr. Z who suggests that the heir to the late Jonas Venture Sr. would have a connection to the new Blue Morpho. This episode will portray the other council members to be the ones who are sure Rusty Venture has become the new Blue Morpho, while Dr. And Mrs. The Monarch is the dissenting voice. Again, these positions are reversed from the last episode. But why? In the last episode, they thought she was obsessed. There isn't anything shown that would make these flips of opinions make sense. I, for one, think it didn't make sense for her to even consider that Rusty was a blue morpho, and she will agree with that later in this episode. Meanwhile, the Monarch and 21 are getting ready for their separate missions. 
21 is going to take out the next villain in line to arch venture, the Wandering Spider, while the Monarch arches the new scientist. This way, the Monarch decreases the suspicion that he could be the Blue Morpho while increasing his level in the guild. The new though vaguely referenced in Season 2 arching levels are referred to as EMA, Equally Matched Aggression Levels, seven episodes into this season. When the Monarch narrates a flashback to the inception of the EMA level system, he uses himself before his flying cocoon base was destroyed at the end of Season 5 as an example of a level 9 or 10. My guess as to why he was only a level 6 at the time is guild politics. The Monarch isn't the most respected member of the guild of Calamity's intent. Then we see that Dr. Venture is trying to get in with the wealthy crowd in New York. All that matters here is that when he goes to the tailor from the first episode of this season, he steals the blue Morpho suit 21 had left there since this tailor shop specializes in apparel for protagonists and antagonists. He wears the suit to a party he's hosting for this guy he wants to impress. 21 as Kano finds the wandering spider leaving the ye old Balax bar, and we see that Balax survived the crash that killed Think Tank a few episodes ago. Kano says he is the Blue Morpho and knocks out the Wandering Spider with a gas gun and flies him to the forest in New Jersey. While he's flying the Morpho Mobile, he narrates a flashback about his first kill, which actually had the guy having a heart attack or something. His narration opens with him saying that he doesn't want to kill anyone, and the last few episodes have had him saying that he feels guilty about the killing. Okay, it's fine for him not to kill anymore. And how he's portrayed in this episode makes it seem like he has never killed before this season. What about the time he joined Sphinx and helped them fight off Monstroso's henchmen, who were clearly killed? What about the time he went after a supervillain named Long Division to accidentally killed him and his henchmen and an undercover OSI agent? What about the time he instigated the other monarch henchmen to murder the murderous Moppets? I guess he feels guilty about executing other villains in cold blood. If that's the case, he shouldn't have even suggested that the Monarch become the new Blue Morpho. He knows how his boss overreacts. Dr. Mrs. the Monarch is vengeful enough to be completely out of character. 21's history and motivation is retconned seemingly to give him something to do this season. Dr. Venture doesn't have anything to do, anything that matters so far anyway. There is a lot crammed into such a short time, and there are cracks. This is the kicker to the episode. Dr. Z visits Dr. Mrs. the Monarch at her home to convince her that Rusty Venture is killing his arch enemies. In this exchange, Dr. Mrs. the Monarch is the cool-headed one she should be. Dr. Z tells her that the surveillance video wide well obtained is proof that Rusty's guilty. But Dr. Mrs. of Monarch says that an illegally obtained surveillance video isn't enough to move on. In the last episode, she said that she knew he was the Blue Morpho because of the illegally obtained video. Suddenly, she's the voice of reason when the other council members want to kill Dr. Venture. Also in the scene, when Dr. Z says that Venture's killing villains, Dr. Mrs. of Monarch says, and I quote, but why? He wouldn't do that. I've watched him stand on the chair because he saw a cockroach. We know Rusty Venture, and that sounds like it could have happened. She knows Rusty Venture, and knows in her heart of hearts that Rusty would not go after villains. He didn't when her husband had been harassing him for decades. There is no reason for her to even have thought that Rusty was the Blue Morpho in the first place. At most, she should have been suspicious of the coincidences that connected the two. To me, this is the biggest fault in this season. Character inconsistency. Let's finish this up. When the older members of the Guild of Calamus Intent arrive at Widewell's apartment to snipe Rusty, he's in the blue Morpho suit he stole from the tailor. Dr. and Mrs. Monarch sees this through the scope and can't believe that he could be the blue Morpho. Again! Remember the last episode? Whitewell pressures her into taking the shot. It's pretty tough talk from a guy named after a corduroy pattern. She fires the shot, but since the blue Morpho suit had Kevlar lining, he survives. 
The monarch's plan to simultaneously send his wife a photo of him arching Dr. Heine while 21 has the wandering spider leave a voicemail that he's been kidnapped by the blue morpho goes off perfectly. <sighs> so that was A Party for Tarzan. Join me next time for the review of the season finale. Let's see how they end this one. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to my channel and follow me on Twitter at GamingGenji for updates on new videos. I'll see you all next time.